Welcome to the Regulating AI podcast. We are live from Leap Deep Fest on the second day on February 10, 2025. I have with me Dr. Ahmed Siraz. He's the head of the AI Innovation Lab at Cornell University. Thank you, uh, Dr. Siraz, for being on our podcast. Thank you, Sanjay. It's my pleasure. Dr. Siraz, we have a global audience, policymakers, leaders, etc. Tell them a little bit about this lab and what does it do briefly? Yeah, so uh, I will start to tell you a little bit about Wild Cornell. So it's an institute. This institute from New York is really focusing on medicine. They have the campus in Doha more than 20 years now with a focus on education and research. I started almost two years ago building this AI innovation lab and building the capability for um, building this AI innovation technologies that serve medical and healthcare professionals. So we're a tech geeks that around 20 members so far that, that we have worked on and trained. They go from people who have PhDs in computer science by even lower grades. Our main focus is to collaborate with the clinicians to ease their pain. If they have a problem, if they have something they want to automate or they need tools for um, assisted diagnosis, for example, based on AI, work with them closely. We have partnerships within Qatar, within the region as well, but also globally. So, uh, Dr. Ahmad, your, the lab's focus is on existing patients. Are you helping any of the physicians in terms of drug discovery or any of the other things happening in Qatar? Uh, not, not now, but I worked on that in my previous uh, lab at mm -hmm. Novartis, the pharmaceutical company, mm -hmm. where we have been using AI, for example, to build AI tools that could really help in shorten the timelines of the clinical trials. As we all know, clinical trials needs most of the time years more the average of 10 years, for example. And we have been working on building these AI tools for the likes of predicting if proteins would interact or not and finding molecules that will actually allow us to, hopefully in the coming years, not so long, to have this clinical trials timeline shortened from years to months. Fantastic. Um, you know, uh, it says a lot about Qatar that it is pioneering this kind of research in medical area and has partnered with Cornell and is doing AI innovation. So because when I talk to leaders in healthcare, you know, we've had leaders of top educational institutions at Berkeley and MIT and others come in. The consensus is even with policymakers, the biggest payoff for AI is going to be in the field of medicine. Right. What do you see at a broader level that for our listeners, our policymakers that can make an impact. We've had guests that come in that uh, drug discovery is going to be uh, speeding up. Even FDA approvals will get speeding up. We've talked uh, about digital twins in terms of drug discovery and things like that. Tell us a little bit, just at a broader level, where do you think AI can go in terms of uh, medicine? AI can play an important role not only to to help the clinicians, right, but could help to to ease some of these issues. For example, we all know that the privacy of the patients are very important. And I'm not sure if you know, but many of the audiences might not be aware that only 20% of the global healthcare data is usable by AI. Mm -hmm. And there is huge problems. One of them is actually sharing the patient data but also even the process to get the data out, it takes extremely long timelines. AI plays a role not only with digital twins, but we, even within the lab, we built some advanced technology that uses uh, the fundamentals of the likes of, deeps, um, of deep fake. Uh, I believe you can go online now and see someone showing a photo of a person, but then they say that's not a real person, that doesn't exist, mm -hmm. but you cannot tell. So we use the same technology now within healthcare that could generate synthetic data. And we have applied this successfully for different domains like radiology, ophthalmology, and pathology that really, if you look at it, you cannot differentiate. But the most important factor for us that these images actually still capture the hidden biomarkers that the clinicians need to distinguish between different diseases. Now you can share this data easily outside of your healthcare organization 
for a different purposes like research or testing AI tools without really revealing any patient sensitive data without the data leaving the hospital. So that's a huge leap. And I think this leads us hopefully in the future to increase our efforts while this process could take probably months, could go to years until you can release this data out of the hospital. And now you can see AI is helping really streamline and having like this process really shortened. Um, I want also to comment about your uh, regulatory side that you mentioned FDA, because I have been fortunate to work on some of the tools during my time at Philips uh, Research, the pharmaceutical company, sorry, the, the healthcare company. And we have built and commercialized tools for AI that could help pathologists. And we have took it from research to commercialization. So we had also to work with the regulatory bodies to prove that these tools are actually can do the job and safe. One of the most important things that you always need to be careful about and you want really to speed up the whole process is to have a thorough and rigorous test of your tool. You need to make sure the data is collected from multiple hospitals, multiple centers, gets validated by multiple experts. This is on the clinical side. On the technical side, you want to make sure that this tool you're building going through rigorous test and functional. So you want to make sure like the algorithms are behaving nicely, but you also you have like the unit test and the function test. And if you incorporate all of these and having a management system that you follow, like the ISO, for example, it makes your life easier because when you have these conversations with the regulatory bodies, especially when you're doing this for the first time and there's no reference for that technology, it will help you a lot. Most of the time they don't know. If you say, I used 100,000 images or million data. They don't know what is the right number. So it's part of it that you're actually also educating them as part of the process, how you have done it and why they should trust it. And this is very important. You made some uh, very, very important points. So I'm just going to bombard you with three, four questions so that I don't lose my chain of thought. But if you can just respond on that. Uh, one point you made was, that only 20% of the data is being used, sure. medical data, yeah. which is an important point. I want you to just give a brief answer. What can we do to get more data? But the second aspect is that a lot of people worry about the abuse or misuse of patient data. Sure. The third aspect is I've had leaders come in from a policy side saying if patient's data is being used and it produces breast that, the other thing, the final thing, and I'm sure there might be more is, you talked about images and things of that, that yeah. nature. Everybody talks about the radiology being, oncology being one of the lowest hanging fruit where AI can do 90% plus in terms of accuracy versus you know, radiologists might be much lower. Um, I want you to just quickly address those three, four points for me. Okay. So you will need to remind me. Okay, the so way, the, but first the first one is 20% being yes. used. What can we do to get yes. more data? Because data is the gold or yeah. the fuel for AI. Absolutely, absolutely. We cannot build AI without data. And as we all know, AI is data hungry. Mm -hmm. I think the issue at the moment is the data there. They're just like uh, rest in silos. Mm -hmm. And I think the processes are extremely difficult. So I think the, the, the answer to that is that we need to have a balanced approach. We mm -hmm. don't want to be very reserved, mm -hmm. but also we want to have everything to be just accessible to everyone. So a balanced approach would be ideal. We need also to think about the processes and the approvals needed. Most of the things that we could have... Uh, we could have done to, to streamline that, for example, is to have like, let's say, uh, some high level agreements or collaboration between institutes that allows you to go through the process once and then for later projects should be. But other issues actually sometimes is out of our hands. For example, if you think about it, any data that collect, that are being collected at different organizations could be collected through different devices made by different manufacturers. So data standardization is still not a solved issue. So we need to work on that as well. Sometimes some data could be out, but maybe it's not compatible 
in the format with other data types. So there's different factors to that, but I believe over time, especially now with, with the AI revolution, that I think there is a push to get this sorted. But I think when I just came through this fact recently through research that only 20% of the data is accessible, I think this let us all think about, figure out the issues and try to communicate and work together to sort this out. Just as a follow on on that, just very quickly, yeah. is there, like in the US we have HIPAA, but also for data there are other things. Is there a global standard or should there be a global standard for medical data that allows people to use it but puts guardrails around it, uh, Dr. Ahmed, for yeah. our listeners? They, they, they should be. I don't think we're there yet, but there is the likes of HIPAA in Europe, you know, the GDPR and all of these. Mm -hmm. I, I think there definitely will come. There also have been, if, if you think about on, uh, not for the um, regulations also, but if you go on a lower level, I don't think there is, uh, I would say one data format for mm -hmm. the medical domain yet. There have been efforts to use like, for example, what we call a DICOM format for medical images, but for example, uh, pathology images is not ready yet to move there. There is radiology, I think they came into that. So now any radiology, X-ray, CT or mm -hmm. any, MRI, they're compatible with that DICOM, but pathology is moving slow. So I think efforts, and I think this will really escalate to the second level of having this compliance as well globally, which is definitely needed to happen. So standards are needed to happen quickly in terms of making sure the data that we get is not abused and should patients share if their data is, is used for training LLMs? What do you yeah. think? We have seen lots of things that uh, I, I think like have been probably raising question marks. I think in general, if you think this example of LLMs, there is the two models. There's the open AI, mm -hmm. a very close approach, mm -hmm. raises lots of concerns about like where the data comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the other approach on the other side of, of Meta, where they have the Lama, Lama. model, very mm -hmm. open. Mm -hmm. You know where the data comes from, you know the architecture, how it behaves. I think for medical data specifically, we need to follow that approach. But you mean the open source? The open, definitely, definitely. Okay. But I think there's one thing that we need to be thoughtful of as well, is who owns the data? I think we have been relying for years now that the organization owns the data and they have the lock to release it or not. Most of the time they could even sell it for research. I think we need to rethink about like the individuals should be the owners of their data, of their medical data. And then they should have the authority to say, I want to use it for research. I want even to gain benefit. I want to sell it to company and gain benefits for that. So I think the whole approach needs to be um, like discussed and, and really involve the individual because the data comes from each person, all of us sharing that. And I think it's unfair at the moment that organization just because you went to the hospital to do a scan and just signed a consent that they could use it for any purpose and even sometimes it could hold the pace of, of this uh, evolution of technology, while maybe the person or the individual say, I don't mind. So I think this whole approach needs to be revisited where actually the owners of the data goes to the individuals and not to the organizations. So since we are talking about medicine, the field of medicine seems to be changing quite rapidly. Do you think the way we train physicians, doctors should also start changing because it seems to me, and obviously I'm looking for you, today when I look at my this phone, I would say about 90% of a general practitioner is sitting in there or an internal medical medicine expert is in there. Now, obviously it's capable of hallucinations and mistakes, but 90%, so it gives people in small towns, villages, remote areas, access to a lot of you know, medical health that they would have never gotten fairly accurate because these things are going to get better fine-tuned with uh, you know, data, better reinforcement learning. The question I'm saying is the role of a physician will, is changing now rather than doing simple diagnosis, maybe there is a better role. What are your thoughts that should we start thinking or is should, someone should start thinking 
that the physicians need to now take on a different role and the way we educate them should change too. Your thoughts, Dr. We, we, we used to, to hear that even in the past decade or two that AI will replace doctors. It's, it's, not, it's not true. Mm -hmm. I think AI is really providing the assistance needed and reducing the overwhelming workloads that the, the doctors have. It's basically a second opinion. Mm -hmm. For example, if you think about like medical uh, reports, a radiologist would spend hours just looking at a case and generating that report. Now with AI, you can do it in seconds just for the doctor to look at it, approve it, and move on to the second case. So I, I think now there have been the shift in, in the mindset. We started to think like AI is not going to replace doctors, but doctors who use AI will replace doctors who don't use AI. So that, that's definitely a fact. And doctors need to be really having an open mindset about learning these technologies. I worked like personally with lots of doctors from different domains. And honestly, some of them, especially like the one that are almost at a retiring age, they don't feel the need to learn that. That's a challenge. Some of them even have been trained like pathologists to look at the traditional microscope. And now when you ask them to look at a large screen, it's not easy. They have mm. been trained differently. But honestly, I think most of them have been open to learn and we always like work with them to train them to use this. And I don't think I could recall any single example that any of these doctors have used AI and wanted to go back. They have been always open, especially that you work with them and build any features or any capability that they need. And this is really when they think like that's extremely useful. So I think the training needs to happen. And I think with the younger generations taking over, probably we wouldn't have this question again in 20 or 30 years. Finally, Dr. Ahmed, I know you're very busy. You are at this conference and you are uh, director of uh, innovation. Is that, uh, are you looking at startups and innovative companies when you look, because all innovation cannot happen internally. I'm sure there are others. What do you see in the ecosystem here, whether it is in Saudi Arabia, in Doha, in UAE, others, what are your thoughts and what needs to be done more for this ecosystem to grow? I think it's, as we're in leap, there's a leap going on <laughs> in the region. I think it's, it's good to see this movement uh, in, in Emirates, in, in, in Qatar, and in Saudi Arabia. This is my third time to visit Saudi Arabia within a year. And I cannot deny how I am amazed with the efforts, the, the mindset, the vision. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really something that is really second to none. I think it's uh, it's it's really you can see people come from everywhere. This is a technology um, event, but mm -hmm. you see healthcare, you see technology, you see it's it's broad, and this is this is really great because if you think even about the healthcare itself, it needs huge communication and collaborations. And there's industry, there's academia, there's the medical doctor, there's the AI researchers, and all of these needs to communicate the regulatory bodies as we have been talking. Mm -hmm. And this is a perfect place where you can see all of these groups coming together. They have panel discussion, there's talks, everything has been amazing, where you can actually see this communication is happening and hopefully will lead to a change in the short time frame. And so I absolutely, this is amazing. And uh, being originally from the region, I'm really proud that this is happening. Well, I agree with you. It is amazing what uh, I thought CES was huge, but this is taking it to another level. But Dr. Ahmed, thanks so much for your insightful comments on what's happening in the region, what is happening in medical data, the ownership of medical data, and what we can look to in the future and what's going to happen in the medical profession. Thanks so much for enlightening me and our users. Thank you so much, Sanjay. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. So